as he said, tonight is, uh, I'm talking about the war of Bar Kokhba and the Hadrianic persecutions, searching for the facts. Because I'm talking about searching for the facts, I'm going to do something probably different. Um, because nobody ever does the facts in Bar Kokhba. Instead, it's all a chant and it's uh, made up uh, to a large degree. And I'm going to show you tonight why I say that. Okay? Uh, I'm not trying to be clever. It actually, I think, is that way. And the reason I say it is basically there's a very small number of facts out there. And when I say facts, I don't mean they're facts, they're sources. They may be telling a lie, they may be telling the truth. I wasn't there. Uh, we don't have a lot of fa sources. And so anything you've ever heard, or I've ever heard since we were kids about Bar Kokhba and this and that and the other, is a lot of a conjecture. And they're, uh, I'm using a nice word when I say conjecture. The, uh, <laughs> the, the fact is, there's a, there's a limited uh, base, and it's uh, sometimes contradictory. And welcome to the episode of Bar Kokhba. It's, in spite of its obscurity, it's left a permanent marker on the Jewish people, not because somebody recently discovered a Bar Kokhba coin or something like that, and not because this appeals to us at the rise of the modern state of Israel, that helps, uh, or not because in the old days in the Jewish ghetto they were looking for hero figures and, and so forth. That's not how things survive century after century in Jewish religion. Bar Kokhba indirectly survives because of Tisha B'Av. Everybody knows, the Mishnah says, I think everybody knows, the Mishnah says, Five bad things happen on Tisha B'Av, and even though you can't remember the whole list, but everybody remembers Betar. Right? You don't remember the whole list, but you remember Betar. First temple, second temple, Betar. And when you say Betar, you say, what's that? Oh, it's by Kokhba, whatever. <laughs> whatever. So, uh, what do we actually know about the Bar Kokhba revolt? I spent a long time now in this series uh, trying to give you, as best I could, uh, the historical context. Now, what's going on in the Roman Empire? What's the little bit we know going among the Jewish people? We know some. And not a lot, some dramatic, some less dramatic. We know, as I left off at the last uh, you know, episode, that Hadrian was in the Middle East in 130. And he visited Israel and Jerusalem, among other places. This, we're told, from a number of sources. So here is, let's go for our first uh, episode there. Let's get past that. Uh, it, one of the reasons we know, is this is a coin, was it Hadrian on it, and this is the emperor and the Jewish uh, 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 lady or something is serving him a kind of a, a carbon. The, uh, the, the, the point is that we have physical commemorations as well as written documents to Hadrian, who, remember I told you last time, spent all this time running around the whole Middle East, uh, the Roman Empire anyway, did get around to visiting Middle East in 130. And we know in 132 broke out the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. So here's two facts. Um, we know that this revolt and we don't know much more that I'm telling you, was uh, very well coordinated, very well organized, centri centrally directed, militarily, politically, and religiously, and we know that it took the Romans two or three years to suppress it. These are what we know. And I want to contrast that with the first war of the Jews against the Romans that culminated in the year 70 with the destruction of the temple. Not organized, not centrally directed. We all know, sadly, that we spend most of our time killing each other. In that war, more Jews were killed by Jews than were killed by Romans. That's quite a statement I just made. Nobody was in charge, and everybody had 20 different ideas how to run the show, and you know, to, and they right away went on the defensive. We know what that means. Here, I wish I knew more, because we don't, as I'll show you in a minute. But obviously, somebody was the balabas. Somebody was in charge, and how would you, what the military now, they like to call command and control. Right? It was a plan that was top down, which is the only way you can fight a war. Um, what else do we know? We know a little bit from a few Gentile sources. Not much. And I'm going to do all of them with you right now. Or just about all of them. The first one, and the most famous, uh, and often quoted, is from the Roman historian Dio Cassius. Who, uh, now, he's not Cassius, the guy you saw in the uh, Julius Caesar movie, you know. Uh, some of us actually read the book. The, um, but uh, Dio Cassius. And... Uh, he was born 20 years after the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And he was a Roman official. So he's writing his books 50 years, 60 years after the Bar Kokhba episode. We don't really have Dio Cassius, right? I mean, we have what he looked like or what they think he looked like. But uh, he wrote 80 books, most of which did not survive, except in the form of an epitome by a monk in the Middle Ages who included the stuff he was interested in and left out the stuff he wasn't interested in. It's a summary. You know, you ever been in school? You ever take notes in a class? 
You ever see two people take notes in a class? Are the notes identical? I finish. So um, as Jews, he probably left out a lot of stuff we'd be fascinated with, I would argue. And I'm going to demonstrate that by the little, tantalizing little amount that he shares with us. And, uh, and let's see, one second. Let me get over here. And we'll put it, in, I'm going to put it on the screen. Okay, Tanya, you got it? It's, what is it? What does Dio Cassius tell us? It's not long. He says, or rather the person who writes the epitome says, that Dio Cassius said, At Jerusalem, Hadrian founded a city and a place of one which had been raised to the ground, namely at Ely Capitolina. So Hadrian visited Jerusalem, which you and I know had been destroyed by Titus in the year 70, and therefore was in ruins. And now Hadrian, in the year 130, which is, what, 60 years later, physically visits the site of Jerusalem. And he decides, Dio Cassius says, to, to uh, uh, raise it to the ground and to build a Roman city on it and call it the capital of Elias. His name was Elias Hadrian. So in other words, Cat's city, you know. The, the, uh, and the capital, you know, the Roman capital is the Temple of Jupiter. So it's called a pagan uh, city. And on the site of the temple, the Jewish God, he raised a new temple to Jupiter. What did he think? <laughs> right? I mean, you, you want to provoke a riot? That's a good idea. Go to the base of Migdash and say, this, you get it? I mean, it doesn't get better than that. One minute. This brought on a war of no slight importance and of no brief duration. For the Jews deemed it intolerable that foreign races should be settled in their cities and foreign religious rites planted there. Darn right. I mean, imagine today if somebody blew up the mosque. Anyway, and so long indeed as Hadrian, so long indeed as Hadrian was close by, in Egypt and again in Syria, meaning during his trip, when he was actually there in the year 130, and he came with legions and all that stuff, the, the Jews remained quiet, save in so far as they purposely made of poor quality such weapons they were called upon to furnish, in order that the Romans might reject them and they themselves might have the use of them. Ah, so somebody was already planning something. Hadrian is there, and probably some guy said, let's, let's protest, and somebody said, Shah. Don't protest. Do it with Chachma. Get a plan. Think about it. And how are you going to get weapons? Didn't the state of Israel, didn't the Haganah, didn't they have to steal uh, poor things here and poor things there and, and re-weld them? And all that. He was just talking about Hazel Father, the other guys in the army, the South Africans, the other. You steal something from the battlefield. You, say, you take it on a trip to, to Tel Aviv. That's exactly what happened at that time. They have to produce things for the Romans. They make them of such quality that the Romans say, I don't want it. And meanwhile, you got a sword, and if you give it to a blacksmith who knows what he's doing, he can fix the sword to make it good, and so forth. And that's how the Jews get a, um, an arsenal from the surplus. Ah, so there's a plan. Now, what else? But when Hadrian went farther away, they open, openly revolted. To be sure, the Jews did not tr dare to try conclusions with the Romans in the open field, meaning they wouldn't take on the Roman army head to head in a, in a straight battle out in the open because this is the era of Hadrian when the Roman army was still at its peak and uh, I want you to understand the Romans were amazing that's why they won so often they practiced 365 days a year if you're a regular Roman soldier or maybe they took off for a couple holidays but almost 365 days a year and I mean that all day long and you learn a Roman general when times were good he could say give me an X and the whole army forms X like a team in the, in the basketball field or the football field I want you to form a W. Give me a V. Give me a, a J. And you can laugh at it, but in battle, what chances do the barbarians have? Here they come, and the Roman guy says, give me first a V, two Js, and then an X. And they've trained so many times to do it, and the barbarians say, what the heck happened over here? You know, like we're sur we surrounded them, and now we're surrounded. And so, according to Dio Cassius, anyway, or better yet, according to the monk, who's giving us an epitome of what Dio Cassius said, he said, the Jews do not want to have open battle with the Romans. Um, but they occupied the advantageous positions in the country. So the Jews uh, relied on the terrain. And they strengthened them with mines and walls in order that they might have places of refuge wherever they should be hard-pressed. So we're going to see later on the Bar Kokhba Caves. That whole business of using the terrain, the valleys, the, gulge, the you know, gorges, and all that kind of business, when you know the territory so well, this is what the Jews rely upon and might together go unobserved underground. They can move from one cave to another grave through tunnels that were dug through the rock and all the rest of it. Who put these things together? Somebody's in charge. It's a chachma I told you before. And they pierce together these subterranean passages from above its intervals to let in air and light. 
Meaning they had engineers who already thought about the fact if you have hundreds of men or whatever underneath the ground, deep in the ground, there has to be water, there has to be air, and so on and so forth. And the Romans, evidently, and this is shocking because the Romans had a very good KGB system, a very good CIA. And yet it was done without them knowing it. And then when the revolt breaks out, Dio Cassius tells us, the Jews therefore had this advantage, uh, if you want to call it an advantage. At first, the Romans took no account of them. So this gives us a little bit like the Maccabean Wars, that when the first guerrilla raids happened, probably the Roman governor or general thought it's just some local band or a bunch of nuts. Soon, however, all Judea had been stirred up, and the Jews everywhere were showing signs of disturbance, were gathering together and giving evidence of great hostility, which again reminds us of the Maccabean Wars, and in general, all guerrilla wars, which start small, and the whole idea is, is to win the hearts and minds of the public and get them to back you until people want to join your army. To the Rome, um, at first, and giving a, what I say, yeah, here we go. To the Romans, partly by secret and partly by overt acts. Many outside nations were joining them too for eagerness and for gain, and the whole earth, one might say, was being stirred up over the matter. Whoa, that's interesting. Nobody else says this. They said when the Jews revolted against the Romans, others like Arabs, Syrians, and who knows what in the Middle East started joining the idea also, meaning everybody hates Rome. I told you last week, Shnei Snuye Goyim Bevitnech. There are two hated nations, the Medrash tells us, the Medrash which was written at this time, tells us was told to Rivka, Rebecca, when she had the twins in the belly, in the biblical story, Shnei Goyim Bevitnech, two nations, Snuye Goyim Bevitnech, two hated nations. Everybody hates the Jews, everybody hates the Romans, everybody hates Yaakov, everybody hates Esau. When they hear, not because they love and want to join the Jewish uh, zeal for independence, but if you knock out Rome, then we want to try our things also. And so the point is, this got out of hand, as far as the Romans are concerned. Um, then indeed, Hadrian sent against them his best generals, meaning then it was a crisis. First of these was Julius Severus, who was dispatched from Britain, where he was governor, against the Jews. So he had to send his best commander. Obviously, what's implied over here, and I repeat, I wish, I wish, I wish we had the original of Dio Cassius, because I'm sure that he went into much greater detail than this epitome that I'm reading you. But this is all that survives. Right? It's clear over here that he sent a couple of generals who were defeated until, the, until you know, like Lincoln. First at McClellan, then at this jerk, and that jerk, until finally got Grant. So that's exactly what happens over here. In fact, we're even told by some, it's not clear, some suggest that Hadrian was himself involved in the fighting, and then, you know, he wasn't exactly the world's greatest general. He was no dummy, but he wasn't a general. He totally had to get a specialist to governor of Britain. Why Britain? If you know anything about the history of the Romans in England, constant guerrilla warfare for hundreds of years, right? Uh, they had huge British English uprisings, and they never could control the whole island. Remember, Adrian could only build a wall to keep the Scots out. And so Severus, the governor over there, is what we would call in modern terms a counterinsurgency specialist. You see? And uh, look at this. Severus did not venture to attack his opponents in the open at any one point in view of their numbers and their desperation. I thought you told me a minute ago that the Jews were afraid to take the Romans on an open battle. I guess something happened in between. And we go back to classic guerrilla warfare like the Maccabees. In the beginning, they were too small to take on an open battle. But obviously, when they started winning, you get more and more people because everybody likes a winner. And next thing you know, you've got a big army, and the Romans can't take them in open battle, or they were afraid to. But rather by intercepting small groups. So he used, as I say before, based on what I'm reading now, he's saying they use a certain type of counterinsurgency in which you don't go, you know, it's a, you hit here, you hit here, you cut off this group, you, you, you take out this group, Constantly, constantly, constantly keep doing it. It really is what they call counterinsurgency. The United States Army is engaged in this sort of thing or attempting to do it in places like Afghanistan as we speak. As we speak. You find out where some group is coming, you try to head them off and whatever. Thanks to the number of his soldiers and his under officers, meaning that he had good troops and sergeants. By depriving the Jews of food and shutting them up, he was able rather slowly to be sure, but with comparatively little danger to crush, exhaust, and exterminate them. So this guy was a counterinsurgency expert. He was a classic Roman general in the sense that he sized up the situation and he devised tactics appropriate to the situation. He said, you know, these regular kind of legionary formations and charge ahead and the turtle and all that stuff, they read about, that's well, not no gay over here, correct? We have to come up with other things and we find that the Jews are in a bunch of caves and places like that in the mountains and you just do one by one. 
you can take mountain number one, surround it, wait it out till everybody starves to death, or something like that. You tend to kill them, then you move to number two, and then you move to number three. So it takes a long time, but if you're willing to wait long enough, and you're willing to bring in enough heavy uh, weapons and all that kind of stuff, you can do it. It's a science. Very few of the Jews survived. Uh, 50 of their most important outposts and 985 of their village, most famous villages were razed to the ground, which is part of counterinsurgency. You see, America could not do this in Vietnam because of world opinion. America cannot do this in Afghanistan because of world opinion. But the British, for example, <laughs> Speaking about South Africa, right? 100 years ago when there wasn't such a world opinion, what did they do to end the Boer War? They did whatever they felt was necessary. You see? 580,000 Jews were killed in the various raids and battles. That's a big number, if that's true. Half a million. And the number of those who perished by famine, disease, and fire passed finally out. Knows. Who knows how many died from other, you know, uh, separate causes. Thus, nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate. No, the Jews were wiped out. A result of which the people had been forewarned, been forewarning before the war. Meaning there were those who said, don't do this. Those who had opposed the rebellion, as this will end bad, and they were confirmed. For the tomb of Solomon, which the Jews are as an object of veneration, fell to pieces by itself and collapsed, and many wolves and hyenas rushed howling into their cities. If you know anything about the Romans and the Greeks, but especially the Romans, omens, omens, omens. There's no Roman that dies without an omen or two happening, you know, a chicken belched or something like that. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, really, you know, a, a fox turned into a dog. I mean, you know, there, there's all, uh, that's classic in all the Roman accounts. Um, many Romans, moreover, perished in the war, meaning a lot of Jews got killed, but a lot of Romans got killed. Therefore, Hadrian, in writing to the Senate, did not employ the opening phrase commonly affecting the emperors, meaning Hadrian, when he wrote his report, to the Senate with the victorious conclusion of the war, this is very famous, is often quoted, he did not write what they usually wrote, which was, if you and your children are in health, it is well, I and the legions are well, are in health. Because he was not able to say, due to the heavy losses that the Romans suffered, that I and the legions are well. So they did win, but it was a bloody business and it cost the Romans a lot. It's remarkable that what I just read you is the only full account, and it's not that full, of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. There is nothing other than this that gives you any kind of uh, overall picture of what happened. Instead, we have to go to other uh, sources that tell you much less. For example, I have over here Fronto's letter to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Fronto was a general and a famous philosopher and an officer of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, and this is written 30 years later. 132 was by Koch Rebellion, 162. Marcus Aurelius was two emperors after Hadrian. Uh, he was a famous, he tried to be a philosopher, but he ended up spending all of his wars fighting off the barbarians in massive battles in the European frontiers on the Danube and on the Rhine. And, uh, oh my goodness, bloody business. And Marcus Aurelius many times was defeated, many times he won. You know, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that, but it happened that way. And at one point, early in his reign, he suffers a bad defeat, and he's all blue, and he's all uh, dejected. And Fronto writes to me, so he goes, Rome has had episodes like this before. You know, get your act together. Look what he writes. The God who begat the Roman race has no compunction in suffering us to faint at times and be defeated and wounded, but always and ever he turns our sorrows and successes, our terrorists into triumph. Meaning, don't get dejected. You've been wiped out by the Germans now. We'll get another army together, and Mir Seshem will wipe them out tomorrow. But, but to hark back, to, not, not to hark back too far to ancient times, meaning you don't have to go to ancient history, I will take instances from your own family. Under the rule of Hadrian, your grandfather, what a significant number of soldiers were killed by the Jews. So here, this is a guy, what you call Masih Lafitumo, meaning he's just writing this to Marcus Aurelius without thinking about the Jews as such, and he's just tossing off. He said, we Romans have had hard battles. We've taken heavy losses. What about the Bar Kokhba rebellion? What about the Jews 30 years ago? So once again, it's amazing that the rabbinic sources and the others pretty much are silent in all this, and, uh, and really, so are the regular Roman historians. Look what I have to come on to in order to pull this stuff out. Uh, and yet, something big happened, as I said before. Something big really happened. Um, we have a very interesting text also from what's called the Historia Augusta, which was what it sounds like, the history of the Augustans, which means the emperors, which some will hold more reliable, less reliable, but it's very, you know, parts of it are better, some parts are worse, but it's very, very interesting because whoever wrote the Historia Augusta about 100 years after the um, Bar Kokhba rebellion says, oh, everybody knows that the Jews under Bar Kokhba revolted against the Romans. Oh, it's a Dover Pashid. Everybody knows because the Romans, Hadrian, prohibited circumcision. I didn't know that. 
Oh, so it mean it wasn't about the temple in Jerusalem? And, <laughs> and why did he do that? So look what you have in the story of Augusta. Do you see what it says? At, no, the one before that? Yeah, at the top. He said, at this time, it tells us, the Jews began a war because they were forbidden to mutilate their genitals, which is Roman taught for circumcision. It's also European talk for circumcision as we speak, correct? They're in the business of prohibiting it right now. And indeed, um, I think you have over here, do you have it from Opianus? Yes, you do. He said the divine Hadrian also stated the following in a rescript, meaning this is a law that Hadrian issued. It's forbidden by imperial constitutions that eunuchs should be made. So to him, he's conflating uh, castration with circumcision. It's a heck of an alliteration, but there you have it, okay? Because to a Roman, it's a barbaric ritual. And anything you're doing in that part of the body is obviously something there to mutilate. See, I use an interesting word. Mutilate is different than to use another word, okay? And different, you see, the whole thing is anti-human, a barbaric kind of ritual, and why Hadrian feels it's necessary for him to interfere in it, but he did, according to this source anyway, okay? And Hadrian says that... Uh, they provide that the laws provide that the persons convicted this crime are liable to the penalty of the Cornelian law, meaning death penalty. Property shall be good reason confiscated by the treasury. Reference to slaves and eunuchs, they'll be punished capitally to masters and those who lie publicly do not appear, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So, in other words, according to this, it was an attack on the Jewish religion or a central institution of the Jewish religion, which circumcision is. It's not a small myth, so we consider it a biggie. And, um, and that ticked the Jews off so much. So then it's a little bit like the Hanukkah story, isn't it? Atiyahu's went after the Jewish religion. The Romans on this occasion, very unusually, are going after the Jews, Jewish religion. When I say very unusually, one very smart thing the Romans generally did, it's well known, listen, they were in business for 500 years. And you can't stay in business for 500 years without having an idea of how to run an empire. Otherwise, it wouldn't last it. So a certain amount of Chachma they picked up along the way. And one of them, one of the great pieces of Chachma, that the Romans discovered early on in their history is a very wise one that we in America, in our foreign policy, try to do today because we know the consequences of violating this. And that is don't interfere with someone else's religion. True? It's not necessarily the best idea to go burn a Koran. And if somebody did it in Guantanamo, uh, Obama got on his hands and knees and said, I'm sorry. And it's not a dumb thing to do. Because politics is one thing and religion is another. And if it serves your purpose as it served the Romans, uh, if you're interested in political control of an area, physical and military control of an area, let them do whatever the heck they want. You see? If the Romans would have taken over India, keep burning the widows on the, on the husband's uh, uh, funeral pile. It's their business. You see? And, if the, and, and historically speaking, the Greeks and the Romans thought that a circumcision is very barbaric, but that's what the Jews do. Leave them alone. If they want to be crazy, uh, let them be crazy. You see? And now... Well, this is the classic uh, style over there. And, and, and uh, it's most unusual that an emperor, and a guy as intelligent as Hadrian, that's the smart thing, would, would, would mess with this. And if what I just read you is accurate in the story of Augusta, look what a hornet's nest he wrote, he, he stirred, by going after a central religious ritual. And what did he expect the Jews would do, roll over? Which means that by 130, Hadrian was either a little bit out of it or was so surrounded and saturated by his Greek advisors that he had descended into a kind of pathological Jew, Jew hatred, which is not at all improbable. We've had rulers in history that they're normal except when it comes to the Jews. And they do imprudent and improvident things when it comes to the Jews, even though the rest of the time they, they don't. And so there's a second one we have. A third one we have is from Eusebius, a very famous Christian historian. Uh, let me see, do I have it on me over here? Uh, where he basically, here it goes. I'll just tell you very uh, briefly, do I have it up there? Maybe not. Uh, but I'll read it to you very shortly. Uh, Eusebius is one of the early church figures, a very famous bishop of Caesarea. Uh, as a Christian, he hates the Jews, of course, but he's talking about what happened in the history of the church, and he's not interested in the Jews, but as a result of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, something important happened in the church. That's his point. And he says, the rebellion of the Jews once more progressed in current extent. He wrote this in the 300s. And Rufus, the governor of Judea, Tinius Rufus, mentioned in the Gemara, whose military aid had been sent in by the emperor, moved against the Jews, treating them with madness without mercy. He destroyed it in heaps, thousands of men, women, and children, and under the laws of war, he enslaved their land. Oh, so was this uh, uh, caused by anything? It sounds like, according to this, it wasn't that they prohibited circumcision. They just went, they had a cruel governor who started killing everybody, and that provoked a giant revolt. 
The Jews at this time were led by a certain Bar Kochbas. So here's the first time we ever hear anybody called Bar Kochbas. Kochbas is not found in the Gemara, not found in the rabbinic literature or anything like that. You see, and it's interesting, right? The name Bar Kochbas, just like Maccabees, is not found in any rabbinic literature. Uh, but it's found over here in the church account. There's certainly a certain Bar Kochbas, which means a star. A man who was murderous and a bandit, but relied on his name as if dealing with slaves, and claimed to be a luminary sent from heaven, a star, in other words, and was magically enlightening to those who were in misery. Of course, he is not a friend of the Jews, therefore, he's looking at Barakov as, as a negative figure. The war reached its height in the 18th year of the reign of Hadrian, in Betar, which was a strong citadel not far from Jerusalem. So here we have an outside confirmation, if you wish, which is actually writ written, what I'm reading it was, is written around the time of the Mishnah a little bit later, and certainly before the Gemara, and it's talking about Nolcha da Betar, which was a strong citadel not very far from Jerusalem. Siege lasted a long time before the rebels were driven to final destruction by famine and thirst, and the instigator of their madness paid the penalty he deserved. Hadrian then commanded by a legal decree and ordinances that the whole Jewish nation should be prevented uh, from henceforth ever entering even the district around Jerusalem so that it could not be seen from a distance from an ancestral home. You know what that means. Not only the Jews can't move into Yerushalayim, they can't live within vision of Jerusalem. Okay? Which case, you know, he's playing hardball. Uh, and he tells a story or two that need not detain us over here. So the point is that um, you get the idea once again, that we know a little bit of what's going on from these kind of uh, sources. Uh, that's it, my friends, from the classical writers. That's all you'll find anywhere in the Greek and Latin writers. A little bit. Um, not long ago, an extra interesting piece, but not very helpful, was discovered in 1960 in Israel, I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about, when the famous Israeli archaeologist, Yigal Yadin, right? He was, a, he was a commander, the chief of staff of the Israeli army in the 1948-49 war. Uh, to be very exact, I know we have some mathematicians and military strategists over here. He was director of operations of the, uh, of the Tzahal during the 48-49 war. And, uh, and later the chief of staff, and then he quit and became archaeologist. Uh, actually, I believe he, he has a degree from Hopkins, so if, if I remember correctly. And, um, uh, and he had mazel. I'll tell you what I mean, mazel. It's actually a good story. He, he uh, you know, when Israel, especially in the Ben-Gurion years, always looking for archaeology to confirm the Jews have been here forever. Because the Arabs say the Jews are interlopers, and Europeans who have never been. You know, Arafat said no Jews, no King David, no temple, anything like that. So the Jews are always looking, and they are looking to today. And, I, and God, I wish them luck to find something physical from the old days. And so they went looking in the Dead Sea area. At that time, Israel only controlled the bottom half of the Dead Sea. I'm talking about before the 67 war. Do you, do you realize this? The northern half of the Dead Sea area was in Jordan. You understand? Hebron, that whole area. And so they're looking in the mountains. It was two archaeologists that were uh, professional competitors. It was uh, Yigel Yadin and Yochanan Aroni, I think. And uh, there's a certain number of caves they want to do. This is a classic case of Shlemazel. Aroni hated Yadin because he always won all these. He got these real cool discoveries, and Aroni got boring stuff. And then to go into the caves, and so they said like this: Cave A will go to Yadin. Cave A B will go to Aroni. And I said, Oh no, we're switching, right? You go there. So you know what happened, right? The, the one that Yadin went into, he found a bunch of Barcopa coins and dead bodies from Barcopa soldiers, and Aroni found zero. <laughs> you understand? So Shlemazel. Anyway, the point is that, we, that they found over here a couple of letters from Barcopa himself. Right? So there was a guy. Now I'm using the word Barcopa. Uh, his name was Shimon Barcosva. Right? Kosva, Koziva, it's not even 100% clear. And here you have in English, here, there's four letters. It's, it's, no, it's no big deal. Look at that first one. Shimon Bar Koziba, the younger son of Masabala, let all the men for Tako and other places who are with you be sent to me without delay. And if you don't send them, let it be known to you that you'll be punished. So he sounds like General Grant, you know, right? He says, I need some soldiers over here or else. Letter number two. Shimon Bar Koziba, the younger son, the son of Bayon. Peace or shalom. My order is that whatever Elisha tells you, do, do to him and help him and those who are with him. Be well. So these are little, you know, chits that a, a general sent. Third one. Shimon to Yehuda bar Menashe and Kiryat Arba. Uh, I have sent to you two donkeys and fill them, send them with two men to Yonason ben Bayan and to Masabala in order they shall pack and send the camp towards you. Lulav and Esrig. Lulav and Esrig. Palm, branches, and citrons. And also send over people with Adasim and Aravas. Isn't that interesting? See that they are tithed. In other words, don't give me stuff that's not my, sir. 
because that either means that he was real from where he had guys in the army that were. Right? So he didn't want to worry about the Nachal Haredi and all the rest of it. And so, right? And send him to the camp to request this man because the army is big. Meaning, I need a lot of, I need a lot of Lulavim and Esrogim, even though, as you know, I'm sure many of the rule, you can, one guy can, you can use a bunch. You know what I mean? In other words, more than one person can use the Lulav. This one benches, he hand to another one. That's how I was raised when I was a kid. They didn't have this business now that everybody loves an Esrogim. Uh, which is a wonderful thing, but they didn't, didn't do it years ago. And here we have something left over by Kokwa, send me some love and Esrogim, and to make sure we're not overcharged. And finally, the last piece, from Shem Bar Kosiba to the men of En Gedi, to Masabal Yonasim and Bang in peace. In comfort you sit, eat and drink from the property house of Israel, and you care nothing for your brothers. Meaning, this is obviously a group that's not coming to fight. Okay? And they're nearby in En Gedi. That's it, my friends. In other words, that's, what we, that's all we have. It's precious. It's wonderful. But it doesn't tell you much. It's all you ha- You see, it was from Jew. Kid Balu of Esrog. Right? The Kid Balu of Esrog Adas and Ravas. But more than that, not much to work with. Uh, what else we have besides this? Well, that exhausts all the sort of things you find in those kind of sources. Then we move to what we find in the rabbinic literature. In the Medrash and in the Talmud. Okay? Obviously, we're not talking over here about halacha, so it's not going to be the halachas of our kochba or all that, but rather it's agadata, the stories that you find, which I told you at the very beginning of the series, you have to know how to read them, and it's very complicated sometimes, and sometimes they're meant to be taken literally, sometimes they're not, but there's nobody that gives you the exact key to know when and where. And I'll read it to you in English, obviously, because um, then everybody will understand that I found this. Uh, already these translations online it saves it a lot of trouble here's one from the Medish Rabban Eicha uh, Tuesday is Tisha B'Av, of course it's a famous tradition to among other things read the Medish Rabban Eicha I recommend it very strongly but that's one of the farm you're allowed to read and encouraged to read it's got all kind of interesting things there not necessarily happy reading material but Tisha B'Av must be a happy time and it says that we when Rabbi Akiva beheld Bar Kozaba remember they don't call him Bar Kozaba Bar Kozaba um he exclaimed, This is the Messiah. Yochem Matursa retorted, Akiva, grass will grow in your cheeks, and you will still not have come. Which means that in the time of Rabbi Akiva and the others, there was no consensus over how to regard Bar Some held he's the real thing, and others held he's not the real thing. And even though Rabbi Akiva, of course, was a big person, you don't need to tell you that. We all know Rabbi Akiva was the biggest of the big, especially in the Tanayim period. But there's other person held like this. But you're betting on the wrong horse over here. This person is not the Mashiach. Grass will grow in your hand. In the Palestine Talmud, which is how they used to call the Yerushalmi, it says, you know, there's something called the Talmud Bavli and the Talmud Yerushalmi. Literally speaking, the Talmud Yerushalmi is a misnomer based on what we just saw a few minutes ago. The Talmud Yerushalmi was composed in the time of the Amoraim. In the 400s, 300s, 400s, uh, there were no Jews in Jerusalem. Right? Not a single Jew was allowed to live in Jerusalem after the suppression of the Bar Rebellion for 500 years, from the 130s to the 630s. The entire time the Romans and the Christians held Jerusalem for 500 years, not a single Jew was ever allowed in, except maybe once a year to pray for five minutes at the Wailing Wall in Tisha B'Av, and that's it, and then you're out. And they pay big money for that quote-unquote privilege. Only when the Arabs conquered Jerusalem under Omar in the year 640, which is 500 years later, did they, because of Islamic reasons, say the Jews can come in. The Islamic reason was not because we hold to the Jews, but if we allow the Christians in here and not the Jews, then it would indicate that from the point of view of Islam, Christianity is a stronger lie, a better, a less of a lie, than Judaism is. And that's not true. We regard both Christianity and Judaism equally as both lies. Therefore, we want to record, you, you get it? So, um, but what does it say over here? Rabbi Shem ben Yochai taught Akiva, Akiva my master, Rabbi Akiva, and I was used to interpret, Darach Kochov Miyakov. It says in the uh, story of Bilam. One of the prophecies of Bilam, he says, a star will shoot forth from Yaakov, from Jacob. And he said like this, uh, Koziba goes forth from Yaakov. Meaning, he said, Shimbar Koziba, Shimbar Kochva, Kochav, they're all one and the same. He darshan that Pusik to apply to this person. And he is the star, the luminary, who is emerging out of Yaakov. Umachas is Pasimo, and he'll smash him up, meaning that he will be the messianic figure who will smash the enemies of the Jews and bring national liberation and that sort of thing. And Rabbi Kiva, when he saw this Bar Kozba, he said, Deinu Malcham Mashiach, this is the Mashiach, Malcham Mashiach. Rabbi Yochim Torah said, told him, grass will grow in your cheeks and still didn't come. So there you have that. That's what we have in the uh, Medesh in one place, and in the, uh, the Yerushalmi Tainus in the other place. Then we have a third one. I'm trying to show you 
a single sustained account of what the heck happened doesn't exist. We have pieces. And now you can join me, as I'm leading you tonight, to put together the picture however you wish. But at least I'm going to arm you with facts, when I say facts, the, the few sources that are there, and then you'll be on your own. Okay? Uh, what does Medrash Rabbah tell us over here? 80,000 trumpeters besieged Betar when Bar Kokh was, loca where, where was located, and with them were 200,000 men with amputated finger. Now, what does it mean, amputated finger? I'll tell you what it means. The Bar Kokh, I told you before, we don't know much about him, but in order to put together the kind of conspiracy that I described, he must have been some figure and some charismatic guy to pull this off under the nose of the Romans, to create an entire network of tunnels, to amass the weapons necessary, to form a plan that took out a bunch of Romans, to shake the empire, to get other nations in the Middle East to join him. We didn't know, we'd love to know who he is, but he must have been somebody, right? He must have been some character. And they tell you over here that he had 200,000 men in his army without a finger. Why? If you really believe in me, chop off a finger. Separate the men from the boys. And 200,000 were willing to do it. So he said, I don't want loyalty, I want loyalty. Right? I, I want loyalty. No, you're in it. it this, this is a, you're in it or you're not. You get it? It's a privilege to join my army. I don't want any cowards. I don't want any shirkers. Demonstrate who you are. The sages said, how long we continue to make the men of Israel blemished? I mean, the rabbi said, this is nuts. Right? You know, that's not the way to do it. And so he asked them, how should they be tested? Let one who cannot uproot a cedar from Lebanon be refused to enroll in the army. So they gave him a great idea for the hernia doctors. They said, ride at full gallop and pull a tree out of the ground. Okay, and anybody can do that is in the army. Anybody not is obviously a loser. So the Marines want a few good men, but Koch wants a very few good men, <laughs> right? And and he thereby had two hundred thousand men of that type too. So that's a lot of people. And I don't know if the numbers are exactly accurate, not not exactly accurate, but who cares? He had a couple thousand men at least who were willing to ride and pull a tree out or chop up a Meaning he had guys that were sworn to fight to the death, right? They had guys who will follow him through fire and water. I wasn't there. He must have been somebody. Right? To get people to do that, he must have been somebody. But the problem is, when they went forth to battle, they cried, Oh God, neither help us nor discourage us. Meaning that the Medrash, the rabbis in the Gemara, are looking for the religious reason, the meta historical reason. They're not interested in the historical. That's clear in the Talmud and the Medrash and the Agatha. They couldn't care less about what we would, be, would like to know. How many divisions did he have? Who were the brigade commanders? What was the strategy? This is awesome. We're going to go to the Gettysburg battlefield and talk about the first day of the battle. Like, who led the pickets charge and the Bakoko's army? They couldn't care less about that. They want to know what kind of a guy was he and why did he lose? And if Rabbi Akiva backed him, he must have been somebody, and I just indicated to you. He was an impressive guy, so Rabbi Akiva didn't pick just somebody. So then Taka, why didn't he lose? He'd be such a great person. Lack of faith. He said, we can take the Romans without God's help. Oh, God, neither hinder us nor, nor help us. That's what they said. You see? This is, this is Kochavi of Simeon, as, as it says in the Chumash. This, the rabbis in Igmar said, oh, that's the reason we lost. We had a good chance. Could have done it. As I said before, Rabbi Kiba thought he's the man. He at least had a shot at it. He had the necessary basic qualities. as the, the charisma, the leadership, but, uh, and the faith. And that's why it's written, oh, God, you've cast us off and go not forth with our hosts. Read it without a question mark. Go now forth with our host. And what did Bar Kokhba used to do? He could catch missiles from the enemy catapults in one knee and hurl them back, killing many of his foe. And the count of this, Rabbi Kiva made his remark. And so they say he did amazing things in the battlefield, which he caught cannonballs. Now, of course, in those days they didn't have cannon, they had the catapults. Even then, it's not, <laughs> not so easy. And I don't know if they mean this literally, if they mean this literally, whoa, <laughs> right? Then he's super bad. And then if you saw that, then Rabbi Kiva says, Dein humalka the Mashiach. Okay? Look, there's a lot of people coming down every once in a while, they'll tell you, I'm the Mashiach. <laughs> I want to see him catch a cannonball, then we'll talk, you know, <laughs> then, then talk to me, okay? Uh, until then, put up or shut up, you know? The, uh, and, 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 and it was a count of this, it says, that Rabbi Kiva saw him and said, this guy is it, he, he's the one. That's one place that tells you the matter. Here's another one. For three and a half years, it says, and this is a very famous tale, all which again goes with the idea of what is the meta-historical reason, what's the religious reason that a guy with so much ability like Rakoch went down the tubes. For three and a half years, the Emperor Hadrian surrounded Betar, and the city was a Belazar of Modoi, who continuously wore sackcloth and fast, and they used to pray daily, Lord of Uranus, do not sit judgment today, and so Hadrian thought of returning home. So once again, very Talmudic. Bar Kokhba had a big army, but the guy that was really preventing the enemy from winning 
was the famous saint, Rabbi Lezer Amodoy, the Tana, whose tefillos, whose prayers were keeping it back. Okay? A Kuthian, that would be a Samaritan. Okay? Uh, in those days, in the New Testament, they talk about the Good Samaritan. In Christian history, it's the Good Samaritan. In Jewish history, it's the Bad Samaritan, right? They hate the Jews, Jews hate them. It's one of those hereditary things that last. And so the Kuthian went to the emperor, according to the story, and said, found him and said, My Lord, as long as that old cock, meaning that old rooster, wallows in the ashes, you will not conquer the city. But wait for me, I'll do something to enable you to subdue it today. No, this son of a gun, he discerned that it was this tzaddik whose prayers were preventing, according to this story, the end of the city. And he says, I'll take him out using uh, intrigue. He, so what did he do? He immediately entered the gate of the city where he found Rabbi Lezer Modoy standing and praying. He pretended to whisper in the ear of Rabbi Lezer Modoy, meaning he went over to him as if he were a spy and ostentatiously whispered in his ear. He didn't say anything, of course. People went and informed by Kozba, your friend, Rabbi Lezer, wishes to surrender the city to Hadrian. Notice he was observed by the FBI. Uh, Barakok was sent and said, brought the Kusin to him and said, what did you say to him? And this guy, playing on psychological mind games, he says to Barakok, well, if I tell you, the emperor will kill me. And if I don't tell you, you'll kill me. I might as well kill myself and not, and not matter, uh, the secrets of the government not be divulged. In other words, I'm not going to tell you. All of which just heated up the suspicions of Rakokhba about the conspiracy that's forming in his mind between the Kuthian on the one hand and the rabbi on the other. You see? Poison his mind. He was convinced that Rebelezer wanted to surrender the city. Went to him, he finished his praying. He brought him, had him brought to his presence. What did the Kuthian tell you? Rebelezer Modoy says, the honest truth. I don't know what he whispered in my ear. I didn't hear anything. I was standing in prayer and was unaware of what he said. I don't know what the guy said. He didn't say anything. But Kokhba flew into a rage, kicked him with a foot, and killed him. So he killed the rabbi. A heavenly voice said, oh, woe to the worthless shepherd, let the flock, sword, and so on. Meaning, if you want to know from the meta historical point, from the religious point of point, why Gai Bar Kokhba had so much going for him, went down, it's because he sinned. You see? Because he sinned. It was intimated to him, you paralyzed the arm of Israel and blinded the right eye, therefore your arm wither and your right eye grow dim. Forced with the sons, the sins of the people caused Betar to be capt- captured, meaning, that's the expression saying then the city was, was, was destroyed. And now you know the real reason? Uh, Barakok was killed and his head was taken to Hadrian. He said, who killed him? The Kuthin said, I did to bring his body to me when he found the snake encircling the neck. Once again, they bring the idea like this. Barakok was not killed in battle. He was actually killed by a snake, which is another way of saying it was divinely ordained. That, you, you, you don't get the point of the story. If you know, this is how you construct it. I got it. You don't get the point of the story to show you it wasn't the Roman might that did it. Don't believe in the power of Rome. It was the hand of God that did it. If God wants to break Rome tomorrow, he can break Rome tomorrow in a minute. He eventually did. It was... Um, he, it, and, he, and he said, if God had not slain them, who could have overcome him? It was applied to the verse, Kilo Kitsur Macham Ba'ashem Yisam, that the, the verse in, in, in the book of Devarim. So these are very famous and stylized kind of uh, descriptions of what happened. I'll give you two more. Because I'm sharing with you just about everything that's out there. Other than what I'm sharing with you, with a little bit of exception, there is nothing else. Um, then they tell you another place. There were two brothers in Kfar Harubu who did not let any Roman to pass there because they killed him. Meaning, these appear to be soldiers of Barcochwa, and they lived in some area, and they were two tough Jews. And when the Romans came to attack, they killed them. They said, the conclusion of the whole matter is we must take Hadrian's crown and put it on our own head. Which means that the Romans said, uh, Hadrian's going to lose his crown over, over this. It's not a good translation. What it really means is that some of the Humilsa means uh, the Hadrian can, can, can go out of business you understand uh, because with these guys if you've got other Jews like that the Romans are not going to win uh, they heard the Romans were coming towards them when they came to form an old man said may your creator be your help against them meaning as they marched out to battle the Romans some old Jews said may God help you and they retorted let him neither help us nor discourage us so you see it's a repeat of the old theme in a different context so uh, there was a story like that and it appears in different ways which is often the way it is I got to talk uh, the sins caused him to be slain. The head was brought to Hadrian, who killed him. Emperor ordered to fetch the bodies. He saw a snake, got him to kill him. You see, it's the same thing. Okay? Um, Rabbi Yonason then says, moving to the next one, Hakol Kol Yaakov, your dime days of the voice of the voice of Jacob, meaning screaming. The Kol Yaakov is the screaming of the victims. It's not a pretty sight. Bay Tower, when it fell to the Romans. When any city fell to the Romans, you can just imagine. And so, the voice of the distress caused by Hadrian, who slew 80,000 myriads of human beings at Betar. That means 8 million people. That's an exaggeration, but no, a lot of people. They killed the inhabitants, although the horses waded in blood up to the nostrils, and the blood rolled along stones 
with the size of 284 liters and flowed down to the sea, causing a distance, standing for a distance of 6 kilometers. You think it's close to the sea, it's 60 kilometers away from it. Now, again, I don't know if this is real exactly, but one thing is clear, uh, there's a lot of blood. In other words, it was, it was a terrible massacre. If the Jewish people ended up recording this as one of the Tishbev days, it must have been a, quite a massacre. Agreed? You know, it wasn't just another episode in the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. It was, it was a bad business. Hadrian possessed a vineyard of 46 kilometers square, which is pretty big, as far as from Tiberias to Sipori, and surrounded it with a fence consisting of the slain of Betar. Do you understand what I'm saying? He took the dead bodies and he lined them up. This is a classic Roman type of style. Show off how many people you killed. Uh, you construct a fence of dead bodies. That's what the fence is constructed of. And little by little, they um, rot, and then you see, you know, bone. It's totally cool from a Roman point of view. You get it? Because you see skeletons. And, you know, if you're a sicko, it's like, it's, it's like really good. So anyway, the, uh, it was decreed that they should not be buried until a certain emperor ro or, or rose in order their interment. Meaning, a number of years later, when it was a different emperor, they finally allowed the Jews to have the zechus to bury the dead. Okay? Rav Huna said, the day the, sl the slain of Beto were buried, they made the bracha tov ametiv. Uh, tov, the body's not putrefying the ametiv because they're allowed to be burial. Um, so he said it was like a nace or something, that the, you know, the body's didn't rot or, or whatever. The point, though, is that uh, he had a fence constructed of the bodies. Uh, now, I don't know if it was 46 kilometers square or something like that, but even if it was a tenth of that, right, you get the idea of what's going on. And this, this is a, a, a classic Roman kind of a style. There's one last point over here. Rabbi Yochanan said Rabbi Yochanan lived after this. He was in the next century. Rabbi Yochanan said the brains of 300 children were dashed on one stone. When the Romans came in, they per perpetrated a massacre. And 300 baskets of capsules of tefillin were found in Beitar, each capsule of 2,100 liters. Meaning, it's like Auschwitz. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They had piles of uh, teeth and piles of belts and glasses. And you, you, you're all familiar with this, right? Uh, I know you are. So the Romans, in the same way, had piles of tefillin, piles of this, and they were huge, indicating there was a big massacre over here. Roman Gamaliel said there were 500 schools in Betar. The smallest of them has 300 kids. They used to say, the kids said, if the enemy comes against us with our pencils, we'll go out and stab, and, and stab them. Uh, in other words, they were so confident, but when the people since caused the enemy to come, meaning when the Romans showed up, they didn't do that. They were the first and second graders. They wrapped each kid in his book and burned them. And I alone is the only survivor, Ram Gamil said. And he said, I'm the, I'm the, my eyes affected my soul because of the daughters of my city. So what do we get out of these uh, texts that I just read you? From the Medish Rabbah, uh, big massacre. Barakoch is a very impressive guy, no question about it, caught cannonballs. And yet, uh, failed theologically, shall we say. Failed religiously. Got too overconfident, too, uh, he, he, he put God secondary, or something like that. Right? And that there's a certain tale, uh, all of which is pieces of the picture, which is he didn't respect the rabbi whose prayers were saving the city. You know, it's all of the same piece. Uh, so you see, the Gemara does not have a very high opinion of him, and that's why he's never mentioned. The term Bar Kokhba is not mentioned anywhere in the Talmud, and the word Bar Kosiv is mentioned very, very rarely, as you see over here. Now I have with you a little bit from the Babylonian Talmud, the classic uh, Gemara, and again, with this, we're exhausting all that exists in rabbinic literature just about. What does it say in Gitin in 57a? This is Kamsa Bar Kamsa. Those who know what I'm talking about know this is a traditional Gemara read. The Agatha that it's read on, the, on um, Tisha B'Av time and all the rest talks about the Korban Beis of Mikdosh. And it says, through the shaft of a litter, Betar was destroyed. Meaning, what, what was it that caused the destruction of Betar? And they tell a tale. It was a custom when a boy was planted to plant a, born was planted a cedar tree, and when a girl was planted to a pine tree. That was a trick one time, the JNF. And when they married, the tree was cut down and the canopy was made, canopy was made of the branches. It's cool, isn't it? Okay? It's cool. You plant a tree for the boy, plant a tree for the girl, and then they cut it down or cut pieces of it, and you construct the chuppah out of, out of that. It's, it's, it's cool, I know. Now, um, we'll start a new custom again. One day, the, the story goes as follows. One day, the daughter of the emperor was passing through when the shaft of her litter broke. You understand, that was the axle or something. And they lopped off some branches of a cedar tree and brought it to her. Oh, my goodness. The Jews thereupon fell upon him and beat them. They reported the emperor. Jews rebelling, and he marched against them. So it was one of those incidents that could easily happen when you have high tension. Get it? The modern equivalent would be, once upon a time, there was an American guy, and he needed to light a cigarette, and he didn't have a match, so he took a thing from the Arab book and lit it and <laughs> burned it. It turned out it was a Koran, and then all hell broke loose. You see? So that's what happened. The problem is, the Romans are not the Americans, and CNN does not exist. Okay. And so, anyway, 
he goes on to say, cut off his fierce anger, all the horn of Israel. This is the Pusik in um, the book of Eich and Lamentations, which they have so many of these midri- tales. God uh, Kariav Kol Cher Yisrael. This is uh, in the Medrash. That that's the locus classicus where all these stories are located. And he said, Rabbi Zeir said in the name of Rabbi Quarter Rabbi Yochanan, there were eighty thousand battle trumpets which assembled in Beitar when it was taken, men, women, and children were slain till the blood ran to the great city, it was six kilometers away. We just saw this in the Medrash. It was taught relatively great. There were two streams of the valley of Yadaim, one running in one direction, one in another direction. They estimated at that time two parts of water, one part blood. That's how much blood was there. And the Bryson was taught for seven years, Gentiles fertilized their vineyards with the blood of Israel without using manure. There was so much blood that the land was saturated with, uh, you know, nutrients or whatever the expression is. Um, then it goes, voice of Yaakov, voice of Hadrian, who killed in Alexandria, 60 mares and 60 mares, twice as many went forth from Egypt, millions of Jews. Well, we already know right away Hadrian didn't kill anybody in Egypt. It's obviously, if you look in the back of the Gemara, it means Trajan. And to be perfectly honest, Trajan didn't kill me either, but Trajan's generals did. That I told you about last week, or two weeks ago. You know, two classes ago. Uh, the voice of Jacob was called by the Emperor Hadrian and killed in the city 400,000 myriads, some say 4,000 myriads. Uh, a myriad is 10,000, so do the numbers, and even if you say, even, like I say, even if you cut it down by 20 and 50 and, and, and 80%, you're still talking about a lot of people. And if the numbers are accurate, oh my God. Right? And then you have finally Rabbi Hanna said, neighbor Rabbi Yochan, 40, 40 times 24 phylactery boxes found in the heads of victim Beitar. Oh, again, the masses of the Auschwitz, of the, of the tefillin, left after it was all over. Beyond I said, three chests containing 240 liters of tefillin. And you have uh, Yudas said in the Hebrew of Shuman Go, what is the meaning? Any uh, Olo Nafshim Kol Benosi, my affects my soul. 400 synagogues of Beitar, each one had 400 teachers, each one had 400 pupils. The enemy entered, they pierced them with their staves, and they prevailed, they wrapped them in the schools and burned them with fire. And you get the general idea of this stylized account. I think that's it. Meaning, when you go through that, this is pretty much what we have out there in um, about the uh, Barcoca episode with a little bit extra. Okay? Now, there's one piece I didn't share with you, but I'm going to share it, be, I'm going to share it because um, it's a very interesting effect on modern Jewish philosophy and theology. Everybody knows, I'm sure, or I won't say everybody, of course, but many are familiar with the famous opinion of the Rambam that the Mashiach is not going to be a superman and a magician, but a great leader, the rational m- messiah of Maimonides. You've, I'm sure, heard this in a thousand tapes and classes and lectures and this kind of stuff. Am I right? Huh? You've heard this before. The Ram- I'll read it to you. And I'm going somewhere with this. The Rambam, in the, the very end of the Mishnah Torah, the very, very end, where Hilchus Molochim, the laws of kings and wars, Hilchus Molochim, Milchim Asayim. And at the very end, he talks about the Messianic era. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I presume too much about you, but this is so famous, it's uh, ridiculous, you know. And, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the top very briefly. The Rambam says, The Messiah will one day restore the, 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 the dynasty of King David. To what it was in the old days. The Messiah will build a base on Megdash. He'll bring about Kibbutz Galiot, as we say, to bring all the Jews from all the world to Israel. And all the Torah laws will go back in the force as they were once again be a from country, as they say. Makriven Karbonus, they'll restore the Karbonus, the, the, the sacrifices, Osin Shemitah Viovo. They'll do all the stuff that they used to have in the old days, the Shemitah then the Jubilee year, Kikomish or similar to like it says in the Khomish. The Khomi Shayna Mami Bunj Mukbi also, and whoever doesn't believe in this is a real heretic, Lob Bashar Navimu Kofi Abba Taurus Moshe Rabinu. And he's oh, drama makes a big deal out of this. That it's a, a, a basic, a belief of the Jewish religion. Now, a little bit later, he says like this, and this is famous. Don't think for a minute. Don't believe that the Mashiach, when he comes, will do supernatural and magical and uh, things like that. That's not the person he is. Okay? There's a long set of Jewish traditions that say that this is wrong. But I'm telling you what the Rambam says. He said, Mashiach will be a great figure, a national hero, the type you could have today. He'll be a from guy. He'll have the right yichus, come from or something like that. He'll be a great general, the Judah Maccabee type. So, you know, something along those lines. He'll, uh, uh, he will uh, uh, take over all of Israel. He'll get the Arabs to move. He'll get the world to agree that they should build a base. Look, you get me somebody that does it, he is the Mashiach, right? He said, he'll, he'll get everybody to agree that the Jews can build a temple. They'll go back to the, you know, that, that kind of thing. But all those are natural, not supernatural, what I just described. 
correct? Uh, I, like, I, I, I don't see too much of a chance happening right now, but what do I know? What do you know? But nothing I described talks about turning people into monkeys or you know, flying through the air. Right? We're not talking, there's nothing from Harry Potter over here. We're talking about a very great national leader, a very great statesman or something like that. It could be. So again, don't think for a moment that the Mashiach has to do literally miracles and do supernatural or, or, or resurrect the dead or similar things. This is wrong. And I'll prove it to you, the Rambam says. This is very famous. Because Bar Kochba didn't do any of these. He was just a great national leader who looked like he had a shot at it. And Rabbi Kiva held he was the Mashiach. Shahari Rabbi Akiva, Chacham Gadol Michachme Mishnahaya. Rabbi Akiva was one of the biggest Chachamim, one of the greatest sages. Fuhoya Nosi Kilben Koziba Melch, and he carried the clothes, meaning demonstrably, he publicly served him, even though Rabbi Akiva was much older and a great sage and all the rest of it. And this guy was a young warrior, but he said, I want to hold your uh, jacket and your train to show publicly to everybody that I regard you as the King Messiah. For Yamalub Shua Melch Mashiach, and he said publicly, it is the Mashiach, the Ramam tells us, Vidimu Huba Chochachma Yedirusha Melch Mashiach, and he and all the other Chachamim, that's not exactly accurate, but he and the Chachamim Yedirusha held that he was the Mashiach, Achen Erg Bavazanta, he was killed. Kim Shen Erag, when he was killed, they said, Whoops, Nodom Sheno, then they said, He's not. For Lo Shalmi Menu Chachama Osamofis, and they didn't ask him for any miracle. So you see from this case, the Rambam argues, that the Mashiach, when he comes, as I just told you before, will be some unbelievable great uh, national leader. You roll up Moshe Rabbeinu and uh, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and a couple others into one, uh, it could happen, right? Uh, the Ikra Dwarb Kachahain and the Rambam, the rationalist says, and that's the way it's got to be anyway. Because the Torah is normal, basically. Right? Now, um, I have no problem with that, but the Ravid does. The Ravid is a famous, Rabbi Rabbi ben David, a very famous commentator who stalks Maimonides page by page. And when every time he makes a mistake or he thinks he makes a, nails him with this, this, this is what he does. Sagas Haravid. That's very famous. And listen to this. The Ravid says, how can you say that Mashiach is not a magical figure and, uh, and does not do supernatural things? The Talmud tells us in a, in a certain place, it's not one that I share with you. The Talmud says in, in, in Sanhedrin, in 93b, a different tale. And it's a very weird, weird tale, which, which is why I told you, once you start to get involved in the rabbinical literature, it's hard to put it all together and how to assemble the pieces properly. I'm going to read you a very tiny hasaga, a very tiny critical remark from the Ravid, who says like this, Amr al-Ram, how can you say the Mashiach is not a supernatural figure? Follow Ben Koziva, how you omer, I know who Malka Mashiach. Doesn't the Gemara tell us that Ben Koziva said, I am the Messiah? V'shalchu chacham labadko imorich v'do'in lo. And the sages, according to the story in the Gemara and Sanhedrin, tell us that they sent to see, can he, can he do the smell test? Now, what do you mean by smell test? Yeshayahu Hanavi, the prophet Isaiah says that the Messiah will be a righteous ruler and with the very uh, the smell of his nostrils, he'll dispense justice. Which they understood to mean like this, that, that two litigants walk in the court, he can smell who's, doesn't literally mean smell, he can discern who's a liar and who's not. Right? And as he can read minds, so to speak. You're the one that committed the murder. It was you that did the thing, you know? And the guy says, yes, it was me. How do you know? So they wanted to see if he can do it, if he's, if he's marich vidon, if he can smell and, and don and judge. Vakivan the law of it, hockey, and he didn't. Katlu, they killed him. Huh? <laughs> so according to this, it was the sages. They killed Ben Kozibo when they found it. Where does that work? You see what I'm saying? So we're all, welcome to the real world. When you want to put all these things together, make some sense out of it, and it's not so simple. You have many ingredients, but I'm not sure what kind of a chant you can put into it without doing what the Ram and others do, which say, I like ingredient one, two, and three, and forget about four, five, and six. You see? But if, if you're a historian, and you want the canons of historicity do not change, we're trying to find out what happened before. We don't have YouTube, so what happened? Right? And we're trying to get it best we can. And it's a week before Tishabu. So we're really trying to figure out. And we all heard about Bar Kokhba ever since we were kids. But I'm trying to show you tonight, maybe in a disappointing way, but it's a factual. You're all grown-ups. Right? And so what do we know? As opposed to what would we like to know, what we like to imagine. So we don't know too much. Uh, so that's, a qu by the way, so many Mepharsha, many commentators say, why did Maimonides say this? Uh, Girsa problem. Maybe knows. Maybe in his version of the Talmud, this story did not appear. Maybe it's a later edition, and maybe it's not accurate. 
I mean, there's other ways of reconciling it. If we want to look for dialectical rec reconciliation of um, clashing texts, that can be done, but that's not, it's not necessarily uh, going to figure out what actually happened uh, 2,000 years ago. I told you it's a problem. That's basically it in terms of literary sources, what I just shared with you. Dao Cassius, and Eusebius, and then three or four others, and a couple of Gemaras, and a couple of Midrashim, and Shalom al Yisro. Well, not quite. Uh, it's interesting that we have some physical, archaeological realia. That's very interesting. What do we got? We got the symbolism of coins, which affords us the sole insight, tenuous as it is, into the minds of the Barakokwa guys. I mean, we got some coins that show you. Now, the problem is uh, uh, that you have symbols. And uh, I'll tell you, a, a couple years ago, in 2009, they found a couple of hundred of Barakokwa coins in a cave. Again, that was a piece of Mazel. This was just what the archaeology students dream about. You know, they actually found a bunch of coins, which indicate to us very interestingly. Uh, he set up a little state over there for a while, for two years, uh, printing of coins. Minting of coins is a sign of your real business. He wasn't some bandit leader, right? He wasn't some killer over there. He was out to set up a state of Israel, so to speak, a kingdom of Judea, if you will. And uh, the main sign of that is when you print coins. They found that these are a lot of them were old Roman coins that they simply restamped. You have a picture of Hadrian on it, and then they stick the base image on top of Hadrian, which I'm sure must have given him great pleasure, you know? Uh, thing, thing, and no, no, no. And, and, and it's kind of it's cool what you emerge with, and we see certain symbols over there of uh, what's going on over there. Uh, uh, let me see, I can't see, look at that, where I'm pointing, there's a star on top of the temple. The star is Kokhwa. Get it by Kokhwa. Here is a, a lulov, okay? Now it's hard to he read the Hebrew letters, there's a reason it's hard to he read the Hebrew letters, and that's because it's in Tzav Ivri and not Tzav Asheri, the old Hebrew script and not the current Hebrew script. Uh, Eitan, let's take it forward to the script for a sec. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go back in a second. Don't you have the script there somewhere? Yeah. It's okay. We'll get it. Yeah, stop. This is old Hebrew. Now, you don't recognize it because we don't use it for a couple thousand years. This is old Hebrew. There's your olive, for example, which is not totally different than the olive, but you can see. But here, obviously, is very different than the dollar, and et cetera. This is called the Ksav Ivri. Welcome to the world of archaeology. That's how they used to write. But we, what you and I recognize today is called Kesav Ashuri. Many people get this wrong because you say the Hebrew now must be Ksav Ivri because I'm Ivri, Ivri, right? I learned Ivri in, in elementary school, but uh, it's not that way. This is the old, old script, and even the Second Temple, in, for, for profane uh, purposes, they use these as opposed to writing Torah scrolls where they use the Ksav Ashuri. The reason I say it is, is I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are from around this time, they're written in our Hebrew, in Ksav Ashuri. You can read, you've seen pictures. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. You've been in Israel or wherever or online. You can actually read uh, the Isaiah scroll or something like that. It's, it's quite similar to what we have today. And this isn't. So now that I showed you this, let's take a look at the uh, coins again. Okay. So here, as I go, go back one. So here, as I say, where is the love? Here it's supposed to say, Cherut uh, Yerushalayim. Here it says, Shimon HaNasi. You know, it's in basic world. There's the, the freedom of Jerusalem. Uh, obviously, the temple, the base of Mishra, must be a big item to them. The star above it represents Bar Kokhba. Yeah, yeah. So you see that uh, the, the uh, symbolism on the... It tells a little bit about what's going on at that time. Let's go to another one if we can do it. Yeah, again, there you see the temple uh, idea. Here again, this, the same theme with the uh, Lulav. That's what it is over here. Let's do another one if we can find one. Here, I can't even see myself so well. But I think, what is that now? There's the star above it. Again, it must be a temple scene. Uh, you, get, you get the general idea, meaning at least we see over here what these people yearned for. We see, as I told you before, it wasn't a Robin Hood band. It wasn't a terrorist band. It wasn't a Turakarta thing. It was only a, they were really thinking that they're a national movement to set up uh, or reestablish, if you wish, a, a Jewish kingdom. And, that, uh, and, there, and, and, and these... Uh, give you an, what's their goal? The Hebrew Yerushalayim. You understand? Now, did they take Jerusalem or not? We have no evidence. I just read you all the stories. You can see from basically what I read you. What I just did, I hope, what I'm trying to do tonight is to liberate. This is a liber knowledge liberates. Meaning, when you know what's out there, anybody tells you anything else, you say, where'd you get it from? Uh, I read it somewhere. <laughs> you know, where'd you get it from? And you can only get it from where you get it. 
So I have friends who say, oh, and there's a theory, by the way, that I see written from time to time, that the Jews recaptured Jerusalem, re- rebuilt the base of Migdosh, they offered carbonas on. Maybe yes, maybe no. But there's no evidence for that. Um, many coins that I told you before have been, have been shown recently, but all this is in conjecture. So that's one set of things that we have from, uh, from that time. Any other coins? Let's go for the next one. Okay, now the other, here's the second set of realia evidence, and the only other thing that exists, the caves. Uh, Eretz Yisrael is mountains, and because of the geology, you know, it's like, it's like the earth burped at one time or another, so because of the geology, a lot of caves, and, and potential caves, inside the hills and the mountains. Uh, these predate the Bar Kokhba era, we know that, or the archaeologists tell me that for sure, but there's no question that in the time of Bar Kokhba, they did major engineering work to extend and expand them. So basically, let me see how, how old and how good a memory people have. This whole cave business, does this remind anybody from my generation and older of any other war? That's exactly right. Do you know that the Americans had no idea of the vast network of underground, you remember this? It was amazing. And the French, uh, when they were occupying the Indochina, they just had no idea. It's unbelievable what was on there. And I'll tell you right now, if you follow the news uh, carefully, North Korea has this. Okay? They have unbelievable things are there, and I imagine Russia probably has from somewhere and, and so forth. The, um, you, 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 you get what I'm saying. Uh, we have and are in the process now, mainly for tourist purposes, of discovering, uh, look how large that is. Let's show some of the pictures. Right? For air and light, keep going. Look at that, see? And they're all over the place, all over the place, mainly in Judea and a little bit in Galilee, which is why they say, based on that, that the rebellion took place primarily in Judea and partially in Galilee. Keep going. Keep going. Look how high the terrace is. Right? And they're built on purpose, as I say, with enough air and light and also with these like controlled places where if a whole bunch of Romans come in, there are places where only one guy can go in at a time. You get it? In other words, a security specialist, as we would call today, was in charge of all this. Where did the Jews find a guy like this? I have no idea. We could write a novel. Maybe it was a Jew who used to be in the Roman army or something like that. Maybe it was some yeshiva guy who just happened to be real good at at engineering. There's always a few weirdos in every yeshiva, you know? They, uh, I I mean it, you know? Uh, Keep going. See, the Romans can't surprise you too well if they gotta go through, Do do you understand what I'm saying? These are like choke points. Control points. What else? And when you go to Israel today, they're, 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 one of the places that you can go on a tour, one of the places is here. I always hesitate to do it because if you ever had anybody over 50 or whatever, it's not, it's not the easiest thing to do. But we did it a couple years ago, one of them. Near Herodian, they have that. Go on. So you see there's a lot, archaeologically, um, hundreds of these caves. If I remember correctly, uh, you won't believe the, uh, I'm not sure if I have the figure right, but I think it was like 2,800 cases as a crazy number. It's amazing. Uh, that they've discovered so far, that doesn't mean today they found everything, but I'm sure we found most. And the, and the vast majority are, what I'm trying to say is like this, this does not happen overnight when somebody says, let's go attack the Romans. This happens with two years of preparation, such as I described before, and possibly even earlier. I told you Hadrian comes to the Middle East in 130, and 132, the war breaks out. Who says that they weren't planning this stuff from 120 or 125? I don't know. But something tells me that this advanced amount of infrastructure work and engineering didn't happen in two years. Now, again, I may be wrong. I don't know, because I can't know. But you, you, do you hear what I'm saying? It sounds like this Barbara Kosheva guy, or whoever he was, was a leader of a coordinated effort carrying out secret work all over the country and somehow or other keeping it out of the knowledge of the Romans, which is the most remarkable of all, because in order to run an empire, the Romans long ago had to develop a highly advanced snitch system. Okay? With the old classic rules of reward and punish every occupying power in the world does that till today, including Israel. You know, there's just some basic rules that you do. You, you, you pay one to tell on the other and all that stuff. It's, it's ugly, it's dirty, and everybody does it. You see? And let me tell you right now, I hope, and so do you, that they're doing that, for example, with Al-Qaeda. To give you an example. This is how it's it's done. And so how did the Romans get foiled over here? Must have been some remarkable uh, conspiracy or something that emerged out of here. As I told you, 
Severus, the Roman commander, at the beginning, the Romans knew what they're doing. If there are 2,800 caves, then every time they go somewhere, the Jews can come out of here at the right moment, hit somebody, and go back into another cave and go here, and the Romans have no idea. And when they try to chase them, they go into one of these little uh, caves and get stuck, and the Jews can kill them. You can set an endless amount of traps. And through this way, it seems, they took out a lot of Romans, and it reminds you a little bit about uh, you know, the Marines on those islands with the Japanese. It was just a bloody business, you know? I mean, they had to go cave to cave, and island to island, you know what I'm talking about, right? They lost a lot of good guys over there, and there is no other way of doing it. Not short of an A-bomb, right? There's no other way of doing it. How many was killed, for example, how many were killed on Iwo Jima? A crazy numbers. Could they go from, even though they bombed Iwo Jima to bits, they thought they did, they didn't. The Japanese were deep, deep down, just like the Jews in Baku were deep, deep down, and when they came aboard, boy, they, you know, you, you know this. And the Marines were good fighters. Same thing over here. The Romans try to do this until Severus comes along, and as I say before, being a top-notch Roman commander, he was, by the way, a troubleshooter. He had been governor of Moesia when they had trouble in the Danube frontier. He sent him to Britain, to England, when the trouble in England. Now Hadrian sent him. This just goes to show you Hadrian was a good manager, and he sent him to Palestine to handle the Jewish problem, and he probably sized up the situation being the profession he was, and so we have to work out a system in which we simply go district by district. We locate where all the caves are, and you don't go in the cave and get killed. You simply surround the area and don't allow any food to go in and out. And you just have to wait them out until they starve to death. You understand? Now, it takes a long time, but it works. Did you follow? No matter how many provisions they got in the cave, sooner or later the stuff's going to run out. It is exactly what the Americans ended up doing often when? Well, in the, in the Pacific. Guadalcanal was not that case because they wanted to take the island. But after they lost so many men at Guadalcanal, what did MacArthur and these other guys do? Bypass the islands. Do you, are you familiar with this? Maybe you're not. Maybe you don't know the American history. After a couple of these times, when they got savaged by fighting the Japanese, the Americans said like this, we don't have to take every island. We just have to take the island that we use for air base for the next leap. And what about all the Japanese and Rabal and all the other guys? Let them stay there and just surround it with the Navy, and sooner or later they'll starve to death, and that's what happened. And so there were Japanese garrisons that stayed in 1943, 1944, 1945, and most of them were dead or dying by the time the war was over. Uh, there's a Lizzie Collingham who wrote the book I mentioned last year about food as a side of World War II. It's a very brilliant work. And she just did the, the, the research. And one Japanese group after another, you know, they, they ended up eating this, and they ended up eating that, then there was nothing else to eat, and then they just waste away or they eat each other. And that happened to the Jews as well, because the Medish Rabbi, I'm not reading it from inside, tells a story, and once again, it's in their style, of a tragic situation in which there were a bunch of soldiers in a cave. Doesn't say it was by Koch, but obviously it was, in the, that war. They're in a cave, and they're starving, and uh, they end up having to eat dead bodies. You know, they crawl out, and they bring a, a body in, and they drag it in and eat it. And the tragic story was a guy ate his father. You know, he didn't, it was, it was, it was, I won't give you the whole details. You know, he put him over here, and, he, and nobody was to know about it, and it turned out a... Uh, I won't say a comedy of errors, but you know what I'm saying. A mix-up, he ends up beating his, his father, who, of course, was dead. The very fact that we're talking about cannibalism shows you that the Roman tactics worked. It's not glorious and anything, but it works. And it can, it, all that matters in the end is, is whether he win. You see, that's all that matters. And so we have over here, as I say before, a picture. What I've shared with you was just about everything. Everything else is chalent. <laughs> it's, it's whatever you want to say it is. Uh, what picture emerges from these sources? Hadrian shows up in 130. Uh, he's either clueless and obtuse or in a super anti-Jewish mood and he decides to paganize the temple I mean just think of what that meant for Jews um, then he attacks Bris Mila it seems uh, here he deviates from the traditional Roman policy of not messing with religion which you can compare and contrast the Seleucids and the Romans the Romans never did that typically uh, between 130 and 132 the Jews prepare in secret the Roman CIA does not find out about the fact the Jews have a highly organized centrally directed operation about to go on Obviously, Shimon Bar Kassib is a very charismatic leader and organizer. He doesn't seem to have fought pitched battles, but he seems to have engaged in the war of a thousand cuts, guerrilla raids, endlessly, which were eff effectively in killing lots of Romans. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did. You know, they don't tell us anything. Maybe at the end, it says the Romans were afraid to face him in open battle, and they re resorted to this business of starving out the caves. So maybe when he got an army of 100, 200,000, and if they were the kind of nuts that would chop off a finger, maybe the Romans were afraid to meet him in battle. I don't know. Maybe defeat the Romans in pitched battle, which will be incredible. There are those who argue, and I won't get into the arcane of it, that there's a certain Roman legion that withdraws from the rolls after this and looks like he wiped out a Roman legion. 
maybe yes, maybe not. If that happened, that's quite remarkable. But if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Um, the Jews, Bar Kokhba seems to have taken Yerushalayim, but what does that mean? Jerusalem was an empty city. It had been smashed and bashed back in the year 70 in times of Titus. Right? What does it mean to take Jerusalem? A um, bunch of ruins. They didn't bring a temple. Oh, we would have heard about that. Did they offer carbonus? Maybe they did. Um, according to Chazal, Bar Koch was the friend or son-in-law of the coin Rabbi Lezer Madoy, the rabbi he ended up killing, according to the story. And it's very interesting on the coins. Do we have it over here? Yeah. Look at this. This says Elazar Cohen. This is the palm tree. Elazar HaKohen in Old Hebrew, in Xav Ivri. And so you see a number of coins talk about Shem and Hanasi, Shem Bar Kochba, the, the leader of the, uh, the civil side, and talk about Elazar HaKohen. Is this Elazar Madoy? Is it another Elazar? Did he have a carbonos? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's possible, but maybe not. You see? Um, you'll hear people make whole statements about it, but like I said, they don't actually know what they're talking about. The, um, or, they're, or they're making it up, let's put it better. Um, Hadrian, it seems, himself was involved in the fighting at some point, but not successfully. Eventually, he had to call in a, a first-class uh, counterinsurgency expert, as I told you. They starved him out like the Japanese did. But in the process of starving out, they lose a lot of men also. And I'm sure the Romans took them a couple times to figure out exactly how to do it. The first couple times, they, they ended up with a hornet's nest. If they took one of these caves one-on-one until they got it exactly right. Um, sometime during these events, Tinius Rufus, the governor, plows over the temple, as Nebuchadnezzar never did. And that's why one of the uh, uh, things that they uh, bemoan on uh, Shavasar Batamas, I guess, is that they plowed over the temple area. Meaning that uh, when the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the place was torched, and then the Babylonian army left. And so the Jews saw the ruins of the temple, and that gave them reason to feel that maybe the future would get rebuilt. But when they totally see them, when the whole thing was was plowed away, then it meant that they realized the Romans were going to build something on top of it, which is going to be pagan, which of course happened. And the Jews realized they're, they're out of Jerusalem big time. And as I told you, it was five centuries, half a millennium, before Jews were even allowed to go into Jerusalem. And let's face it, we have been exiled from the Temple Mount since then. We can't go up there. You said, well, Israel controls the Temple Mount. But you know and I know, it's, it is what it is. It is what it is. Right? And they're afraid to stir up the Muslim hornet's nest. And so, the Bar is still with us today in that regard. Um, when it's all over, the Romans, as it's clear, acknowledge that it was a costly war. Sometimes they, pl turn the, they, they plow over the temple. The sages are divided. And their role in all this is unclear. Other than the fact that some support Bar Kokhba and some do not. Rabbi Kiva says the Mashiach and the other ones say grass will grow on your hands before that happens. Uh, ever since then, especially from historians and, and writers, have been more focused on theological justification of Rabbi Akiva than at getting at the facts of what actually happened. Get it? Because it's very embarrassing. He picked, he said he's a Mashiach, and he wasn't. Like, how's that happen? I thought, then a big rabbi says, some of them, it's like divinely got it. Uh, following the crushing of the rebellion on Tisha B'av, it seems from the rabbinic literature, not from any outside sources, that Hadrian then unleashed a campaign against the sages. And on the other hand, it seems that only a few biggies were killed. We know stories of famous martyrs. You know them and I know them. They take Rabbi Kiva and they comb the flesh off of him with iron combs. They take Hanani ben Tradin and they burn him with a safer Torah wrapped around him. They chop off the tongue of Chutzim and Torah and all this. And this is very believable. This is what the Romans used to do. No question about it, because they want to see exemplary punishment. On the other hand, we're not told about vast numbers of people being killed other than them. And uh, actually, if you read very closely, if Rabbi Akiva would have been willing to stop teaching Torah, if Hanan ben Tradion had not been willing, had been willing not to teach Torah publicly, it seems they wouldn't have been hurt. And so it's very tricky to go to know what's going on over here. Uh, I'll, I'll say again, the Romans were torturers and killers, and they did it. But what exactly is going on beyond that is hard for us to get at. Um, this is when, historically, uh, typically we talk about the ten martyrs which have entered the liturgy, the davening on Tisha B'Av and the Kinos and on Yom Kippur. But everybody knows the Ten Martyrs itself as an idea is anachronistic. It's not true. Meaning, there weren't ten killed at one time. Some of those people, even the art scrolls say it in the, in the Moxer. This is just simple. Some of the ten were killed in the year 70, you know, in, in the War of Titus. I'll give you an example. Rosh Gamliel or something like that. And then Rekhi was 60 uh, some years later. And so we use it sort of poetically 
to say the ten martyrs of that era. Because whoever wrote that was thinking, the Romans is all one thing. Titus, Midas, Julius Caesar, you know, they're, they're all a bunch of Roman goyim. You know, but that, that's, that's how they thought about it. You see? You know, it doesn't matter when and where. It's the opposite of what I'm trying to do tonight. Um, it's clear Rabbi Akiva emerges as a powerful figure in this uh, whole operation, but we don't know that much about it. You know, how? Uh, one place I just read you said he saw him catch a cannonball and that convinced him. That couldn't have been as simple as that. Right? You know, something was it, and I just told you about it, Koko must have been somebody to get the kind of uh, following he got and to organize the way he did. He must have been really somebody. Um, we also know from this era what they call the Shemad. Shemad means religious persecution, which they tortured uh, the religious Jews or the sages and all that, the ones they did. We know that this caused some people to crack. It's the famous story of Elisha ben Avuya, Acher, who turns and joins the dark side. Correct? He was one of the leading sages, and under the terrible pressure, he, he, he active, becomes a quizzling. He actively cooperates with the Romans. Um, Elisha ben Avuya wanted to tanoim, him, and then he switched, and therefore they don't want to call him by name, they call him Acher, the other guy. Uh, we don't know exactly why he switched, and, and, and that's reflected in the fact that there are four stories that I know of you find in the Talmud and Medrash four totally different stories as to why Achav went off the derech, as they say nowadays. One I'm sure you've heard of, it's from the Gemara and Kedushin, that says that once upon a time Achav was sitting there and a father told his son, go up to the tree and get me Shiloh HaKeh, you know, chase the mother way like the Torah says, bring me the eggs, and the kid went up there, fell down, broke his neck, and died. And that was like too much for him, he said, it can't be a God if that happened, because the Torah says, you honor your father and mother, you live a long life, you do Shiloh HaKeh, you know, meaning he had, he had religious uh, issues. Okay. Another story is that he was modern Orthodox from the day he started. Sifre Minus, you know, books of heresy were falling out of his pocket when he was in Shul. And, you know, oh my God, he was a left winger. You see? A left winger. Another version is a totally different one. He was one of the four holy sages that went into the Kabbalistic parties. And, he, and so he was a very great man, but don't get in Kabbalah if you don't know what you're doing. And it, and, and it, and it ruined his mind. He emerged from that experience. Uh, damaged, which is a, a, a cautionary tale, and so the person should never get involved in Kabbalah unless you're very grounded. Only Rabbi Kiva, Nichnes B'Shalom B'Yatsa B'Shalom, which is a completely different story than what I just told you. And the fourth story is, and one that rings true or, or, or rings a bell with us today, he did it because of Auschwitz. Meaning, the, the Yerushalmi says he saw the tongue of Rabbi Chutzim Samaturgaman lying in the ground, being eaten by dogs. Rabbi Chutzim Samaturgaman was one of the great rabbis, a saint and all the rest of it. And basically, he said like this, how could God let somebody like him, that the Romans cut his tongue out? Oh, you're the great orator. So they chopped his tongue out, and then they killed him. Who knows how they killed him? And the dogs were eating the tongue, and that snapped something in him, which is identical in my mind to somebody saying like this, I was in Auschwitz, I don't believe anything anymore, which I totally understand, right? None of us holds guilty somebody that went through the Holocaust, you know, get it? So it's a different, but all I'm trying to tell you is that the persecutions were of such a nature that they uh, snapped in him. It's not simply that he d said he doesn't believe anymore. Jerusalem tells stories where he joined the Roman KGB and he fingered Jews. And he said, there's a secret hater in this place, go arrest him and kill him. And there are Jews who are trying to get around the prohibitions of Shabbos. The Romans would tell them on purpose, carry uh, stuff on Saturday. And if you're a Talmud Chacham, you know, there are certain tricks and shtakes you can get around it, such as Shnaim Sha'achzu. For example, this book is big enough for me to carry by myself, small enough for me to carry myself. That's true. So if I carry it when I'm not supposed to on Shabbos, then you're doing a big sin. But if you're very clever, I'll go to Jonathan and say, the two of you will carry it together. Then since they're not doing it, since one person's not doing it, so that reduces, that's not an iser de rice anyway, it reduces severely the sentence. You can do that with any law system if you know the, the laws. And Acher, according to the story, would tell the Romans, no, make one carry it. Right? Don't let two, don't make one. What do you, what's that all about? Meaning he totally uh, switched, and the fact that somebody's one of the sages to do this just gives us an idea of the terror, the reign of terror that lasted uh, for a while after there. There's the story of Rabbi Huda Mbava who sacrificed his life for the Jewish church, as I told you the other day. He's the one who runs away in order to give semicha, the old-fashioned, the real semicha, to keep the Sanhedrin going. Uh, to the Romans say, whoever does it will get killed, and any town is in there and get killed. And the long and the short of it is he goes out into some in the wilds, and he bestows this meek on the students, and then gets killed, but, but the students escape. And the idea is he perpetuates the Sanhedrin. Again, shows you the Romans are going to try to destroy that kind of institution. 
Hanani uh, Ben-Tradian, as you know, gets burned at the stake, literally, with the wool around him, because even though the Romans say, if you don't t- teach Torah in public, we'll leave you alone, he's going to do it anyway. And so he wants to win a moral victory of the Romans, which he certainly does. Right? Because if the whole purpose of this was to try to discourage the Jews from staying loyal to the tradition, then religious martyrdom is not a smart idea, guys. I'm talking to the Romans. You get it? Religious martyrdom is not a smart idea. It's much better to corrupt the elite than to use them as martyrs. And if somebody can even try and says, I'll rather die at the stake, especially when the famous story is that the, that the executioner was so moved that, you know, the, that he helps them, and all this, and, and the executioner jumps in. Uh, what's, what's the moral of the story if you're a young Jew? Stand with the Mesorah. Right? We will outlive them. You see? And so, it's most unusual what I'm just describing over here. The Romans usually didn't go after religion, but Hadrian, especially in the last three years of his life, 135 to 138 after the rebellion is crushed, is, look, I, I, I can almost say I don't blame him. He, he was not exactly happy about the Jews. Of course, it's not his fault. It's never the emperor's fault. someone else's fault. Um, but according to this, he was uh, enraged, and he held the rabbis in, in charge, and for uh, a couple years, in the aftermath, it was bad news, and yet we have no evidence that there was a persecution of Judaism in the city of Rome or elsewhere in the empire that I know about or anybody else. And so what was this, a local thing? Is it a national thing? Is it Mishigas in the part of the emperor? Was it some strategy in the part of local Roman generals? Was it an imperial policy altogether? Who knows, maybe if Hadrian didn't die three years later, maybe it would have eventually flowered into something bigger. Verves, it doesn't know. The good news is that he got sick. In the last year of his life, he was in bad shape. Then he kicked the bucket and, uh, and he was succeeded by the next emperor, uh, Antoninus Pius, which means Antoninus, who was very, who was very uh, pious in the Roman sense. He took care of Hadrian's body, made sure it got a nice funeral and things like that, even though Hadrian wasn't nice to him. And Antoninus Pius didn't have all these hang-ups. And he went back to the net regular Roman policy. We just want to control the country politically, we want to control them militarily. He would not let the Jews uh, go back to Jerusalem. He doesn't want anything to lead them to New Zionism or anything like that. But he stopped, as far as we can tell, he stopped persecuting physically the sages and the others and things went back to the regular result. One interesting result I conclude with, or two, is that um, one thing we do know, Judaism becomes so persecuted in the 130s that the Christian church stops being Jewish. This is when it happens. You can read in Eusebius and in other places, they say, oh, then to be Jewish was really bad news. That's when the church says you no longer have to be Jewish to be a bishop or a macher over there. And the uh, seat of power clearly moves away to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles are not out for being persecuted by Hadrian. You see? And that's, of course, a major influence in Jewish history. I repeat, in Jewish history, because it meant that more and more Judaism, Christianity stopped being a form of Judaism. And ironically, what the prayer of Laminium did not accomplish, the, the persecution of Hadrian did. Because it was during this era, the first generation of the Tanoim, that uh, they wrote that extra paragraph in the Shemona Esrei, which is directed against the heretics, which at that time were the Jewish Christians. Laminim al sikva, don't there be no hope for the heretics and all this, which is sort of like making every Jew say every day, to hell with these guys. And they figured that will cause, and, and I don't know if it did, but Hadrian's stuff set the Christians to go off on their own uh, big time. What is the conclusion of all these? The war left the Jewish people prostate, prostrate in, in, in Israel. The central Israel is depopulated pretty much. Uh, from now on, all Jewish history afterwards takes place in the Galil, in the Galilee. The Mishnah and all that period all is in the Galilee. The Yerushalmi, as they call it, all take place in the Galilee, almost entirely. Uh, places like Tiveria and Sipori and Caesarea, which used to be not Jewish centers, that's what's left, guys. And so that's what happens over here. Uh, the Jews learn the harsh rules of surviving in the Gauls of Edom under the Roman Empire. After this, the Jews do not undertake to uh, rebel in any kind of way against Rome. They just have to, you know, hope and pray, uh, which I'm very good at. The Roman Empire went on for a couple hundred years. Uh, in the Middle East, the Roman Empire went on for 500 years. Okay, the Byzantine Empire was, a, was the Roman Empire. And so it was a long time. And afterwards came the Arabs, you see? And so uh, it's not a pretty picture. This is exactly why we regard the Rakoch Rebellion such a national tragedy, why we regard the fall of Betar, which is a very vivid example of this, with all this blood and fill and everything, you know, as, as sort of the iconic picture of the suppression of this rebellion, but mainly has to do with the idea of a kind of a, of a uh, what's it called, the uh, Gedalia kind of aspect. 
which is the Makkah Patish of the destruction of the temple. Um, they didn't play their cards right. Now, it sounds like they did play their cards right, but it didn't work anyway. Meaning, they, 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 they did repair and make up for the deficiencies they had in the first war. They had a, a leader, and a charismatic leader, and a guy who clearly knew what he was doing, uh, and a plan, and a network of caves, and all that kind of business, and yet uh, it, didn't, it didn't quite work. So uh, it obviously is, is, a, is a great tragedy, and it's a cautionary tale on many levels. Um, what exactly the nature of the cautionary tale is already, it's not for the history, it's not for, that's for Jewish writers and rabbis, everybody to patch you with, you know, the Zionists will say it's a cautionary tale for Zionism. The anti-Zionists say a cautionary tale against Zionism. The religious will say it's a cautionary tale in favor of religion, like we just read in the Medrash. The non-religious will say it's a cautionary tale against the religion and go for Jewish secularism. So everybody takes the past and tries to make their own chalon about it. What I've tried to do tonight is share uh, such sources that exist Anything you want to make up from now on your own, at least be aware of the fact that you're making it up, and whenever you read anything or see anything from now on, you'll be able to say, he didn't mention this, right? And now, oh, now you're becoming a historian. Good night.